Welcome to the Benefits of Research panel for the Students and Careers Research Symposium 2021. We're really excited. Um, and so this panel that we have right here is composed of individuals in different fields and from different schools from, and also in different academic stages. And so we're hoping that y'all can hear a bit more about how to get connected to undergraduate research, their experience, what to look for in a lab, and so on. And so my name is Cesar Esti and I'm the moderator for today. Um, I'm the Outreach and Marketing Coordinator for the ESA Student Section. Um, and so throughout this panel, I'll be taking questions from the audience along with our other moderator, Arona. Um, and so just please drop them in the chat throughout the panel if you have any questions about um, for either panel or just the ESA student section in general. And so we have a really fantastic, exciting group of panelists today. And so I'll go to start introducing them. And so uh, each panelist will kind of introduce what they do, where they're from, their expertise and so on. And so first you have Jeremy. Okay, yep, my name is Jeremy. I'm a postgraduate research assistant at SUNY Cortland. I just graduated from SUNY Cortland in the spring from their conservation biology program. Um, and all of my research experience is pretty much loosely in community ecology um, with some invasion biology sprinkled in there. Uh, these days I'm finishing up a few undergraduate uh, research projects as I'm applying to grad schools. Sweet. Thank you for that. And then, so we'll go ahead and click to our next panelist. And next we have Ajisha, who's one of our own as well. Yeah, while I was doing the clicking. So hi, everyone. My name is Ajisha Allen. I am also the Marketing Outreach Director of the USA Student Section. Um, so my field is less ecology, more on the biology side of things. So I my area is microbiology and immunology. So actually more into biomed. My day, it's all related fields. Um, so I work with host pathogen interactions. I study viruses and host immune responses. So that's what I study. Um, but I also do ecology education research with ESA. So, you know, and that's that research is going to be like a really relevant part to this panel because what I study um, on what I research is essentially what skills you develop while you do your undergraduate research experiences for field work. And, how you, you that translates to how what employers would expect out of you. So that's what I do. And okay, I'm at the University of Florida. Forgot about that. So but I will start my PhD. Not sure where yet, but hopeful. But I know I will start it in the fall. So that's me. And yeah, I will click for awesome. the next one. Sweet, thank you. And, and then so next I believe we have Sulai. Yes. Yes. Hi everyone. My name is Sulai Rodriguez. And I am a recent graduate from Florida State University. And I spent my undergraduate working on my honors thesis, which investigated cryptic coloration in green leaf spiders, as well as any responses they had to any changes in their environment. So I'm really focused mostly on like behavioral ecology. Um, and currently I am in Miami, but I'm still doing some kind of work with Florida State University. And um, was there anything else I needed to answer specifically, or was that kind of the gist of the? No, that's a great. Thank you so much. And so, last but not least, we have Ashley joining us, and so she wants to go ahead and introduce herself. Hey guys, my, my name is Ashley. I'm a first year master's student at Florida State University. Um, I am mostly interested in the behavioral ecology of sharks and rays. So I did an undergraduate thesis looking at the effects of tidal and diel cycles on the space use and movement patterns of a couple different species of sharks. And then now for my master's, I'm looking at, um, I'm using telemetry to track small tooth sawfish, which are a critically endangered ray species to try to figure out where they are going for mating and pupping. And yeah, it's me. Um, sorry, I just had one question, quick question for Ashley. What's the name of the fish species that you're holding in your hand in the picture there? I was really curious. I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, so that's a cowfish. It's um, a local species that you can find like off if you ever go down to the FSU Marine Lab. They live down in the seagrass. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and Cesar, you can take over the panel and do so. Okay. Hey, thank you. Yeah, so um, this, uh, my first question for everyone is kind of just a general question and applies to everyone. Um, so everyone works in very different fields, you know, marine biology, plant ecology, and so on. And so beyond these skills, how do you see yourself transferring these scientific skills um, outside of the field? And also how these skills kind of helped you move further in your own career? 
we can start with uh, Zulai if you'd like. Yeah, so um, generally, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say science just requires um, such a wide variety set of skills and performing my undergraduate research was great because I not, not only got experience in what I possibly want to pursue in the future, but it also really introduces you to like talking to other science, science as a like kind of collaborative and like team effort. And I feel like that was a really important skill that I learned having to learn how to work with other people and work on a project together simultaneously. And that's something I'm gonna carry with me both as a graduate student and in the future with whatever further research I do. Sweet. Does anyone uh, else have anything to chime in? Well, I can add a little bit since I'm like probably the most unconventional person because I'm not in ecology or in closely related biology. So mine probably is closely, closely, okay, that's a bad word, uh, most closely related with <laughs> disease ecology and, you know, host pathogen interactions is strong. So I have to understand a lot of things. So there's a lot of interdisciplinary work that happened within my field. So as I mentioned before, I do biomed work but I also do ecology education work. And one thing I learned in all of my research with skills development and everything is that most of the skills you learn that you're going to use in your career, especially if you're like experiences are not directly aligned, is the transferable skills, you know, teamwork, working with people. I mean, you need to be able to work with people if you want a job. So in you know, all those things are things that you can transfer out of your research experience and take it into your career because that really is, doesn't stop with one discipline or with one particular job. You take it almost everywhere, like project management, time management, all these basic skills that people don't necessarily talk about it enough as they should. But you know, these are things that you can like take around anywhere and it'll definitely help you. So even if you don't think you're gonna go end up in a job that's directly aligned with your research, use these other skills that you should be able to get out of it. Yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, sweet, thank you. Yeah, I think you covered a lot of it. I think another important skill is project management. And so I'd love to ask uh, Ashley now, um, how, what does it look like planning a master's thesis, especially one that's like using this acoustic telemetry and all these things? Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of moving parts. Um, something I was going to add, uh, if you're doing field work of any kind, you're going to gain um, some good teamwork skills, but also building your own independent skills is a huge part of it. So depending on what extent the project is your own, you might be having to find your own funding and um, defend why your project is worth funding. So there's a lot of planning that goes into it. Um, and then while you're actually out there doing it, if you have a heavy field component or even in the lab, um, a lot of critical thinking and problem solving skills are definitely going to be built up in most types of projects that you would do. So there are definitely a lot of things to consider, especially for me working like we're out in bay conditions and we're on a boat for multiple days at a time. So it's not just the technology and the equipment, it's also the weather that you have to look out for and things like that. So you just have to plan ahead for a lot of different situations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and, um, and so this is also more, this question would be geared more towards Jisha and Ashley again. I was has this experience of like undergraduate research and also now you're doing a master's thesis. Um, how does this research kind of influence your academic goals and also maybe like what you plan to do after finishing your master's? I know Jisha talks about PhD applicant, um, but what does that look like and how did you kind of stumble upon that from doing undergraduate research? So I guess I'll go first. So like I mentioned, so I will be starting my PhD in the fall this year and it was an interesting journey i would say i mean when i but i all but i already knew what i wanted to do like when i came in with my undergrad but there were you know points where i was like oh i want to work with treatment methods for diseases and you know i want to do research and you know change the world and all those fancy dreams coming in from india so i'm, I'm an international student so that's another thing that's that has impacted the way that my undergraduate research experience was so most of actually not most, all of my undergraduate research experiences were voluntary, 
I did not get paid for it. Um, I get I got additional scholarships and other things to pay for my tuition, books, and other things. But my undergraduate research experiences, my RA experiences, all were not paid. They, I got course credit for a few of those, but that's about it. So, and and one of them, the one with ESA, I got a scholarship to live and learn in DC, and work live and work in DC. So I guess in the meantime, I think it was mostly my classes, but also I kind of already knew what I wanted to do. So all those things in compounded led, led me to do grad school. So, I mean, obviously there were a lot of crossroads. I was like, okay, MD, PhD or PhD. And I think at that point is where ESA helped me a lot. Academia is not an easy decision to make and you shouldn't do it unless you're really, really sure you're okay spending the rest of your life in academia, writing grants, like Ashley mentioned, you need to ask money for everything, like funding your projects, whatever, you know, as a master's student or a PhD student, you need to have money. So for that, you need to make sure you're okay doing a lot of writing, a lot of reading and critical thinking. All those skills really, those are also the skills that I learned from my undergrad that I'm now still using in my grad school uh, work and my post back work. So currently, you know, I work in a lab, well, not right now because we're in the middle of a pandemic and I can't go back. But when I was in the lab, sometimes my cultures wouldn't work. My lab, you know, I myself just wouldn't want to live. And I don't know what was going on. I can't do anything about it. So at that point, critical thinking, and you gotta go step by step, see what you did wrong. Is Was the temperature off? What was off in for in that instance, what you learn is what you kind of learned back when you were an undergrad is like, oh, these are ways I can like kind of have backups to problems that arise. And that's kind of how you kind of get around it. You're not gonna get around it all the time, but that's where you talk to people and kind of get advice for that. So I guess that's my long-ish answer to that. Thank you. And Ashley, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I can add on. So for me, um, the transition, it kind of felt like a natural transition going from undergrad into my master's just because I'm, I did my undergrad at FSU. And so I got involved in the lab that I'm in now as a freshman during my undergrad. So I started out volunteering and then I went on to do a direct and independent study. And then I ended up doing a thesis in the lab. And so for me, just because I got so much time working out in the field in these systems, I just over the years kind of developed specific questions that I was interested in. And so I graduated, I took a year off and worked at an aquarium for a while. Um, and then I kind of gave myself that time just to think more about what kind of questions I would want to investigate in a master's. And then I kind of just pitched it back to my advisor. So um, if you can get involved early, like if there's something that you think you even might be interested in and you can be a volunteer or get involved in any capacity, that's a really great way to um, just kind of see what where interests fall and in that experience, even if you're just volunteering, you can be developing your own questions during that time. Yeah, I have a yeah, quick thing. Oh, I have a quick, so sorry, Cesar. I have a quick thing to add to that, like, since I didn't really talk about why I ended up applying. So another thing is that unconventional experiences does not disqualify you for grad programs. It does really does not. So I, most of my projects and my papers that are published are really not in biomed. I mean, I have one in progress, but you know, it's not published yet. So I think what grad school programs really would look for is your ability to do independent work and your ability to conduct research, critical thinking, problem solving, all those fun stuff. And also it is okay if you don't have as many experiences as your peers. It's, again, you might need to have work, work jobs, take a lot of classes like I did. I could, I, since I was an international student, I had to graduate within a certain time frame, And you know, that made me less able to take a lot of you know, opportunities. So make do with what you have and don't ever put yourself down. If you wanna to go to grad school, you've made a conscious decision. I am going to dedicate my life to five years or two years of masters of very difficult times, but I wanna do it, then project your best self. And that's my like only advice for like grad students. It's like, it doesn't matter what, what your background is because you still can get in. Yeah, thank you for that. And I've been kind of going based on what Ashley said, like getting involved really early on. Um, I'll start with Jeremy here and we can kind of work across everyone here. Um, how did you select the lab you worked in and kind of what does it look like to find the right project or the right lab to kind of latch onto you throughout your undergraduate career? Sure, so my lab, I started off in the lab I did most of my undergraduate work in because I was taking my intro botany course 
And I think I asked my professor what her favorite native wildflower was, because I really love native wildflowers. Um, and so we started talking about that. And then it was somewhat serendipitous because I, I commuted, so I was local. So over the summers during the field season, I, I was pretty available. So uh, she asked if I was available the following summer to do field work. And that's kind of what kicked off my experience in the lab. So my experience was, uh, you know, born from chit chatting about your interest in biology. And I, I suspect that for most students, if you show your professors that you actually really love biology, they'll get excited about the possibility of you working with them. Um, maybe a more pragmatic approach, though, to selecting a lab is to kind of balance, you know, ideally getting in a lab that you can do work that you're interested in, but not worrying too much about the exact topic. And maybe more so thinking about skills. I think, you know, looking back in, in retrospect, like there are skills that I might have liked to pick up that I could have gotten from working in other labs. So somewhat thinking ahead and thinking about do if I want to be a microbiologist, like uh, probably work in a microbiology lab to learn how to run a PCR or something like that. So there's a level of pragmatism, also a level of thinking about who you're working with. Is that going to be a good fit? And then also, am I going to be able to get excited about this project? All things that you have to take into consideration, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, Zulai, do you have anything to add to that? Like, how did you get involved in your lab? I know you work with spiders and plants. And so was it linear? Or were you always interested in plants and you kind of hopped into that or did it kind of fall into your lap? Um, so it was kind of linear and nonlinear. So initially when I started research as an undergraduate, I worked in Dr. Hughes' lab and she does really cool work um, studying like the variation in male Trinidadian guppies and how that um, she kind of studies like sexual selection, I believe through that. And that was really fun and I enjoyed that, but eventually I kind of fell into a class I really enjoyed. I took ecology with Dr. Miller at Florida State University and just through recognizing how much I enjoyed the content and specifically what specific content within the course I enjoyed, I kind of figured that like, the genetic aspect of ecology wasn't really my niche, but more so the behavioral. And just over the course of, I volunteered with him in his lab, and then I did a DIS, which um, if you're at Florida State or at any university with a DIS, I heavily recommend that. Because um, you not only get research experience, but you also get a class credit. But eventually, I kind of worked up to me asking him to sponsor me and to be like my PI on my honors thesis. And he kind of provided me with a variety of CIS um, is what it's called in case somebody wants to write that down. But um, he kind of provided me with a number of model organisms. And I went ahead and I chose to work with spiders just because um, carnivorous plants were really cool but he was talking about spiders and we have this really cool of spiders. You can really cool species of spider you can find all throughout North America that shows color variation. And I kind of went about it that way. So I tested out different labs. You're more than welcome to do that. You don't need to commit to one lab. And then once I found a professor and a subject, I really enjoyed, um, I kind of was really clear to show my enthusiasm and just wanted to show that I was like super excited to work in a lab and that I really wanted to just give it my all. And um, he took me under his wing and it's just been great ever since then. Sweet, thank you for that. Uh, Ashley, do you have any, yeah, I know Ashley kind of talked about you were involved freshman year and so it kind of worked out, but were you always interested in marine biology before that or did it also just fall into your lab? Yeah, so I was also, um, before I actually chose to come to FSU, I did a tour of the marine lab. And so I learned a little bit about what the marine faculty were researching. And that was really interesting to me. That's ultimately why I chose to come here. But my freshman year, I really didn't know like how to go about getting involved or anything like that. And I actually took a seminar class. I think it's called uh, Biological Science Frontiers at FSU. And it's just a class where um, it was like a one credit hour colloquium and each week a different professor or grad student would come in and talk about what they do and kind of how they got there. And so 
it just turned out that my advisor gave a talk one week in that lecture and he said if anyone wants to volunteer in the field like email this grad student and we'll get you on the list and so that's ultimately how I got involved but I did do a couple of I volunteered in a couple other labs too pretty early on so it's good to test out a few different options just to see um, what you find the most interesting where you kind of fit in the best uh, and then I know some schools have like FSU has the Europe program some schools have really great programs to get involved in research in your first couple of years. So you can also look out for those if you just aren't sure about how to go about getting into a specific lab. Yeah, I think I did a DIS too. So I did um, that when my second, okay, third year. So that was my first lab. And again, I started out being a biomed major, ended up switching majors because I interviewed with actually a lot of um, labs. I used to email them. Okay, I'm super interested in your work. I really need these skills because I want to go into this, you know, into grad school. Can I come volunteer at your lab? I would go, get interviewed, get accepted. They would give me a tour of the lab and then they would try to send me to HR and get me to fill the paperwork. And then they would tell me, whoops, your visa status doesn't make you eligible to even volunteer. And I would be like, a, a, like three or four of those. And I was like, okay, I'm going to switch my major and get some more, you know, like undergrad. So I ended up changing it to clinical psychology and then did some neuroscience courses as well to see if I actually liked in micro or if I like some other form of biomedicine. But yeah, so my first project actually was like three honors class projects combined together, got approval from the honors office, made it into a honors project, which I then ended up presenting at a conference. So unconventional ex experiences exist. And you, know, you kind of hear stories from other people and just try to get like your feet into as many things or as little things with the specific skills that you want to get out of it. So that's what I would say. Never let it hold you back. Yeah. I wanted to jump in really quickly before we move on. Um, yeah, yeah, Ashley mentioned Europe, which is a really good resource at Florida State University. However, I know throughout the nation and specifically in Florida and Georgia, we have the FGL stamp, which is a Florida, Georgia, Louisiana um, Alliance for Minority Participation. And basically it's an organization that pairs you up with a graduate mentor and they kind of show you the ropes of reaching out to different um, professors. They provide you with a lot of research and travel opportunities. And basically um, they helped me out so much in my undergrad because they, again, they paired me with that graduate mentor and they kind of helped me overcome that initial anxiety as an undergrad of like talking to a professor, asking to work in a lab and even applying to graduate school. Like that's their main goal and they help you through that so much. So if anyone's interested, definitely look up LSAMP and they will definitely help you kind of get some research under your belt. Zula, is that all, oh, is that Alsamp, the Lewis Tokes Alliance for Minority yeah. Program? Is that one, right? Yeah, I was in yeah. there. Awesome, sweet. Thanks for sharing that. And kind of jumping off the back of that, um, of like picking the right lab, there's a research interest. I want to go on the other side of that and talk about mentorship and what that looks like in kind of the trade off of like, okay, this lab is really good, but maybe not the best mentor. And what does it look like to find the best mentor? Um, and so we can start with Jeremy on this one um, and just like, what does it look like to find a good mentor in your field or have you had experiences with good and bad mentors and what does that even look like for yourself? Yeah, so like I said, my undergraduate research started off because me and my research advisor both really liked wildflowers and they thought we thought they were pretty and so I got involved in that lab. Um, but I was really lucky that my research mentor um, throughout my undergraduate uh, experience was stellar. I mean, it was, I think that the, the key aspect that I think is probably really good with any research mentor is uh, finding someone who you can, who can figure out where you're at and who can meet you there, right? So like most freshmen don't come in with tons of research experience from high school, like that's weird. Um, so having a mentor who can be like, okay, well, like I will guide you in the first steps and will, and can also like watch you grow and like take steps back to give you um, more responsibilities, more independence. I think that's all really important as you progress through your research experience. Um, but I also think that it's really good to have more than one mentor if you can. I think it's super, super important to like um, 
build a body of people that you can contact for advice and for mentorship uh, and like bonus points if they're not at your institution at all. So you have like some people at your institution and then people maybe in a different department or in a different institution somewhere else. Cause like you're always going to wanna have someone that you can contact and get like a second opinion on or you know, if you want to rant about someone in your department or something like that, it's good to have someone far removed. Um, but all of that mentorship, I think, is really helpful. Um, and the ESA SEEDS program helped me a lot with that. So um, at the annual meeting, um, the SEEDS program does a really good job of hooking their students up with some mentor for the meeting. Um, I got hooked up with uh, Dr. Lucas Valderesk at Michigan, and he was super helpful. He helped me with my GRFP application. He was super awesome. And I definitely like see that as another mentor that I can send an email to and ask a question if I need another, if I need some more advice. So there's definitely avenues to find mentors as well that are really helpful. Yeah, thank you for that. I would love to ask Ashley that too. I know you transitioned to grad school with the same mentor, I believe. And so what did that look like? And also like, are you pulling mentors from outside departments or like building your committee, kind of what Jeremy talked about? Um, selecting most people in your institution. Um, what does that look like for you? Yeah, so I'll say first, um, when you are going about choosing an actual mentor, I think there are two distinct like mentorship styles that people can have. So some are really hands-on and then some are really hands-off. And so if you're someone that needs a hands-on advisor, it might be good to talk to like other grad students in the lab and figure out what kind of mentorship style that advisor has. Um, for me, mine's really hands off, which I like, um, but I know some people don't like that at all because they, it's hard to be productive um, or it can be hard to be productive without someone like checking in on your progress. And so that's a really important thing to note. And then also, um, it's not just necessarily the PI in the lab, but the grad students in the lab too are also going to be really great people to mentor you. So I know with my work as an undergrad, I worked a lot more with the grad students in my lab than the actual lab advisor. Um, and so now I kind of have transitioned to where I am a grad student in the lab. And so I can kind of carry that on and be a mentor if we get undergrads later on. But um, yeah, so definitely take that into account as well. And then trying to think, what was the very first thing that you asked me? I feel like I missed something of your question. Um, kind of just like how, what it look like to transition from like an undergraduate in a lab into like a grad student in a lab and like how did that mentorship with your PI change? Oh, okay, yeah. So um, as an undergrad, it was very, it was very different, like I said, just because I was mostly working with the grad students in the lab. And then the summer after I graduated, I actually worked for a summer as a lab tech. So once I graduated and I was taking my gap year, I spent just one field season just working for Dean, my advisor. And so through doing that, I got a lot more time with him. Um, I helped him teach a, an ichthyology course down at the lab. And so after we had more time to work together one-on-one, -on -one, I think it kind of solidified the fact that I thought I would work well as a grad student in his lab. And so sometimes it might just take time to get that uh, FaceTime with your PI because sometimes they might not always be around. I know it's different for labs that your advisor is on the main campus, but my advisor works at our marine lab and not on our main campus. So sometimes you have to just find other ways to kind of connect with your advisor. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Jisha, Zulai, did you have anything to add to that in terms of finding a good mentor and what that looks like? Well, finding a mentor was really hard for me, particularly because I was in community college for the first two years. So I was at state college. So as you know, the resources and things they know, especially as an international student in a very, very interesting situation where I wasn't eligible for most things. I still had really great mentors that I still talk to. So my honors director was the department biology chair. She still, she wrote me some of the recommendation letters that got me into a PhD program. So, you know, she was, she's really nice. And like Jeremy said, it's always good to have like a group of mentors that you can like reach out to send messages, you know, my mentor from my community college, I can give her a call anytime and be like, hey, you know, I, I, I ran into this 
how do you think I can like, you know, come away from it? Like, I, I just want to talk for a little bit. So, you know, there's different types of mentors. And like Ashley mentioned, for like grad school, there are two types. Well, and usually, you know, people tend to be either one or two, but some people are in the middle, like hey, really hands off. So like my PI right now, she's really hands off. Um, but kind of also in the middle, she does check in at sometimes, but she expects like me to take the initiative to like go be like, oh, hey, I have a question. Can you answer for me? Um, and then other things like she's barely in the lab either. So, you know, there, there are differences. So for me, like Ashley mentioned with grad students, so I work with my postdocs the most. So those are the people who train me with like new skills. They teach me, hey, here's how you do this. I have a question. I go to them. So it really depends on your lab as much as it depends on your PI. For PhD though, or masters, make sure your PI is someone you can work with and has, has no history of issues with like conflict, especially with like publications, sending your conferences. So some PIs like to be really play the favorite and sometimes the favorite might not be you. So you don't want to get that wrong end of that stick. So for me, finding a grad school mentor, and this is something I follow when I go for interviews, and this is something I did this time, what vibe do they give me? Like, how, are they gonna be really hands-on? Are they really gonna be hands-off? I like to work a lot, so I'm borderline workaholic. So actually, I'm actually workaholic. But so I want someone who's gonna be like, if they see me working at like eight till in the night, like every day, I'm like, hey, stop, don't do that. You need to go and get some relaxation. Obviously, I don't require that, but that's something that I find interesting that people actually care about my mental health as well as my work. So I, I don't like like a really hands-on, like a babysitter PI, but you know, kind of somewhere in the middle is what I would prefer. And it's always good to know your preferences while you look for mentors. And also if you, like Jeremy, you mentioned that you talked, you had a conversation about what wildflowers and then that, that person became your mentor and things like that happen all the time. Even at an interview, it might, it did for me. So, you know, that's kind of like how you, Gauge the vibe you get from them and then kind of go with that. Definitely ask their students before you choose a mentor. Ask their students, make sure they like them. You will probably like them too. So that's that's the tips I have for finding a mentor. Great, thank you. There's a lot of, there's a lot of good stuff there. Do you have something to add? Yeah, um, again, like Jeremy said, everyone's been repeating. It's really great to have a group of mentors. Mentors can be professors you like. In my case, my first mentor was a graduate student I really enjoyed um, often. So I found to my mentor because I was taking lab, the lab for biology too. And it was a course where everyone was kind of like not engaging, but I was sure to pay attention and participate really well and listen. And just off of showing my enthusiasm, that's kind of how I met my first mentor. And um, I knew she was a really good mentor because she was constantly forwarding me emails and trying to get me involved into different activities in the department and also trying to help me like do research and stuff like that. And I just really appreciated that. So my big note is like your mentor doesn't always have to be a professor. It can be a graduate student. And then eventually I just, I found my mentor because like I said earlier, I took his class and I was just really enamored with his style of teaching and just who Dr. Miller was as a person. And um, I could tell from the way he engaged with his class and the way he engaged with his students that he was a really good mentor who just wanted to see his students succeed and just wanted to show anyone who was enthusiastic about ecology just how fun ecology was. So that's kind of like, like, yeah, like just engage with the people around you see what they have to say. And then from there, you're going to find someone. People in science are so eager to find other people who are enthusiastic about the same things as them, even if you don't have that big research background. As long as you have a smile and you're like, hi, I love this. They're going to be like, I love this too. Let's talk about this. And then from there, you never know what you're going to find. Yeah, thank you. That was really good. Um, so we're going to backtrack a bit and just talk about time management and research. And so like Ashley talked about earlier, like you have long days on the boat, you know, all these classes and stuff. So I'd like to start with her and then go to Jeremy for this question. How did you, like how much time do you spend on your research project on average and kind of how do you balance this with like school, you may be teaching in grad school, field work and other non-academic obligations like self-care um, and things like that. Yeah, so I'll say for me, um, I think it kind of depends 
what specifically you're doing. So for me, my heavy field season would be in the summer. And so I typically didn't take classes during the summer unless I was just rolled in like thesis hours um, just to not overload myself. So I, I kind of made sure to plan ahead and leave that time open so that I could take the weather windows to go into the field when I needed to and things like that. Um, during the school year though, during the fall and spring, it, there's a bit more balance that you had to have. So I did constantly have a job. I taught a lab as an undergrad and also had my classes. And so for me, um, I'm like a huge plan and plan ahead person. So I like to plan out like my day as a schedule. And so I think for me, a big part of the time management was just at the beginning of the week, I would break my responsibilities into little chunks and divide them among days um, and just make sure to always leave myself time to do something that I enjoy. So I really like to be outside. Um, I like to scuba dive. So I usually try to give myself like a day on the weekend to go be outdoors or do something like that. So there's definitely nothing wrong with giving yourself a day off or even half a day off. Um, I think at first I would feel almost guilty if I wasn't working and I knew I had stuff to do, but it's important to remind yourself that you, you deserve that time and you need to rem remember to give yourself that time. So I think for me, just breaking things into smaller tasks and then dividing them up was the most useful thing for me to do, um, even though overall my my work wasn't weighted throughout the year evenly if that makes sense since i was mostly in the field in the summer so i think it kind of depends on what you're doing but as long as you try to plan ahead and break things up so you're giving yourself time it's the best thing to do for sure jamie do you have to add to that yeah so i think that the conversation of time management like starts off with like money as a big factor, right? A lot of us have to work through. So I had to work throughout all of my time in undergrad. And so that can be a really big complicating factor. Um, I was really lucky that I could get paid in the field seasons for the research I was doing. So like seek out those opportunities and ask your advisors for how you can get paid for research if that's an option, because that'll help out with time. Um, I would, I'll give my like undergrad perspective and hopefully in a year I'll have like a grad student perspective. But in undergrad, um, I would describe most of my time management as triaging, um, which is unfortunate, but there's a lot to do. There's classes, there's work, there's research, and there's a social life um, and like taking time for yourself. Uh, I think that my priorities might be um, controversial, but I said that research was way more important than classes for the most part. So I was never like a 4.0 GPA kind of student. Like I got a lot of Bs, a lot of B pluses and a lot of A minuses and some A's. Um, and I like learned a lot in my classes. I loved my classes. And I, you know, always tried to keep a GPA that was like reasonable to get into grad school, you know, like I didn't want a GPA that was prohibitory to get into grad school. Uh, but really, I think in undergrad, like taking opportunities like research is probably going to do better, you know, especially if you're applying to grad programs in the sciences. Um, like in interviews, you talk about your research, you don't really talk about your 4.0 GPA too much. Um, so I definitely emphasize like triaging, putting research and opportunities that you can produce something like a presentation or a publication up there at like the top of your priorities. Um, but also like making sure you don't get burnout. Like Ashley was saying, do stuff you enjoy doing. I definitely had moments of burnout and it sucked. And then I didn't want to do anything. So try not to get to that point, like go outside, do fun stuff. Um, yeah. So you know, put a pause in this conversation. I believe AJ has a question for one of the panelists, question mark. You can go to unmute yourself. Yeah, well, it's not so much a question, I guess a follow-up comment to exactly what Jeremy was saying to avoid burnout. It's also good to, um, cause it's actually something I just read up on with research of time management and actually, um, like you said, prioritizing, um, you said you were doing classes and research, 
of course, research, you know, it's definitely something to produce and to have, you know, on your record. Um, and the conflict of, oh, should I do this or should I like study? Should I do homework? Well, funny enough, it supports like it's more, I guess it goes more into the psychology element, but when you break up your time, right, especially with classes, right, with academic with academics, for some reason our brains are more, uh, what do you call it? Um, they said they seem to to work better when we take our time and we do it in little segments here and there for like assignments instead of crunching for hours and burning ourselves out, stressing ourselves out. We do it like either 30 minutes here and then 30 minutes there, an hour here, an hour there. And then we go to research, just have those days or even what Ashley was saying, having, you know, our day to ourselves, half a day or a full day to ourselves. It all balances out um, all up in here. Um, keeps us productive and I wish I could link um, it was a it was a research uh, article um, one of one of the scholar journals uh, had published them and I was reading up on them I wish I could link it to it but I found that quite interesting because I would think that oh time management you have to do one thing after the other you can't break your stride otherwise you're going to crash you're going to burn you're going to do all that but it's quite the opposite it's you know just as long as you do it to your pace and your comfort um, and also prioritizing, like you said, I'm kind of the same on the same boat as Jeremy with, you know, I wasn't always a 4.0 GPA student too. I got uh, B minuses and stuff like that. And I prioritized opportunities, um, a little more than classes, but of course you know, classes are important, especially if you're, if you're paying for them. But, uh, but yeah, just, just a comment. Dude, thank you so much for that, Jess. Yeah, I would really like to know what the article that was. Um, that seems like a really interesting one. I did have a couple of things to add about time management coming from a person who lives and works in the lab. Well, not lives. I haven't gone to that extent yet. Um, and I don't hope to in grad school. So what I do is like, uh, like Ashley said, I plan my weeks out rather than days. I plan my weeks out because usually my experiments like take several days at a time. So I try to like plan, okay, first two days, I'm going to do this. These two days, I'm going to do that. But I also play professional badminton. Now I can't because we're in the middle of a pandemic, but when I used to go to the lab, I wanted to make sure I had time to go to practice like in the evenings. That's another thing I asked my PhD, um, uh, the PhD students and the PIs I talked to like, when do you get home? Like, you know, when do you leave every day and after classes and everything? So I want to make sure I have time to play, to train, and then to go for tournaments later on. So that's another thing I would say, look out for your mentors to like how, what they kind of expect you to do. So some mentors won't, will kind of like implicitly expect you to like work a lot. Some mentors explicitly will say, oh, you got to sit and do your experiments and you have to have them completed by this time, even if they go wrong, even if they don't work, you still have to like stay and do them over and over again until you get them right. Make sure you ask that before you kind of go into and time management is always really important as a skill that's actually one of the skills i would most recommend you like focus on when you do undergraduate research experiences especially if you're not doing them in a field you're going to go later on into that skill is going to save your life when you're kind of going to grad school or something else yeah um and so we've talked a bit about grad school applications and whatnot so the next question i kind of want to ask to uh jeremy adisha also do lies since we're all like in that process of applying um would like to find opportunities for that that are also in your you know your field of interest and also how to make sure that you're fighting for yourself during those moments and making sure you're finding the best that you can find for yourself oh uh, well um i'll go first since my my cycle is like kind of already over so i kind of know where i'm gonna go i'm just waiting for one final letter to come through and i'm done so you know for me well i'm still i did not hear back from some of my schools yet but I already made my decision sort of, so I'm, I'm fine and done. So I applied for 10 schools. Again, not a number I would recommend anybody apply to, but I did that because I got so many um, fee waivers this time to apply when I attended the NIH grad school fair where I, I scouted for these programs. So another thing, this is not my first app cycle. It's my second. I did not get in the first time because I was last year and I wasn't able to complete my project because of the pandemic. And it just simply, the timing was just so terrible 
it didn't work out. Um, but I did, I was in a master's program. I had to leave it because scholarship, everything. So your unconventional experience and like you guys were mentioning like C minuses and B pluses. I have an F in my transcript. I know that's weird, but there was a really difficult time in my second year. I do have one. It was, it's still there. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have the, you know, the finance to retake it. It was physics. I didn't need it. So I only took organic chemistry, which I needed. So, um, you know, but I still got into program. So I, for me, when the application process was really weird, because one, my major is not what I'm applying to grad school for, well, my undergraduate major. And two, I have limited research experience. I have a lot of research experiences, true, granted, but they're all in different fields. Um, only one is in my in the area that I want to go into. So what tip I would say, like go into an interview and you're essentially like impressing them to like take you in as a student is like, first thing is just talk about the work that you like. And if it aligns with them, tell them that like, you know, I like this work about you. Can we talk about this? Like what opportunities you have? Like, I know this is probably not a popular tip to have, but like in an interview, try your best to steer the conversation to having them talk about their research. That way you don't get questions. You learn a lot more about them and their experience and all of that. So that's kind of what I did with my interviews. Like I let them talk about themselves and then I just prepared like a couple minute answers for like what my research is, why I'm motivated, two questions that most interviewers will ask you, but that's it. Then I kind of like flip it over to them. So, but yeah, so Cesar, did you have any other additional question that I'm not answering? I'm um, just kind of making answer? sure that like you're getting the best for yourself and these. So I know like, some opportunities don't come paid, for example, or you know, perhaps mm -hmm. there's some other issue that you might find with the PI and like making sure you're kind of comfortable and like putting your foot down for yourself oh, in terms oh, of finding these. Oh, things. definitely. So, you know, when it comes to grad schools, don't look at their rankings or like where they rank in like the U.S. rankings or whatever, your mentor is going to be your first priority, at least in my opinion, of course, yours might differ. For me, mentor, second students in the lab that I'm interested in, and then in the program in general. And the third thing is like the topic. So for me, my grads programs all have rotations, essentially, so I can like kind of rotate and figure out which lab I want to do my dissertation in. So if I know most ecology programs don't have that option. You kind of directly go in with a mentor. So, but if you have that option, then definitely look at the labs, the labs, not just one lab that you're interested in. The other thing is for me particularly, I, I'm, you know, currently I'm involved with ESA with doing a lot of DEI work, doing science communication. I want that same thing in my grad program. So that's another thing. If they're not diverse or inclusive and they don't feel that way, I am not gonna choose to go there. And that's one of the reasons why I'm making the decision I am now, even though I thought it would be best for me to stay and go to some of the other programs. But at the end of the day, mentors, people, the vibe you get, because even if they're, even if it's like Harvard or something, not that I'm saying it's bad, but you know, if they don't give you the feel like you're going to live there for five years and you're not going to be happy, if you're not happy during grad school, your life is going to be miserable. So that's the only thing, like finding the best for yourself starts from your mentor and the students. So that's that's the only tip I would say, find the best people. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jeremy and Dula, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I can um, talk a little bit about my process thus far. Disclaimer, uh, I'm applying right now. So in a year, I could tell you what totally worked and what didn't work, but now I can give you some vibes that I have. Um, I think that exactly what Ajisha was saying, um, your mentor is super, super important. And ecology and some of the adjacent fields are have this system of grad school that you might you may or may not know about, which is that you probably should be talking to who you want to work with in grad school before you even apply. Um, and that's very disciplinary. I talk to people in physics. I talk to people outside of STEM and they don't do that. They just apply to programs without having talked to a research mentor. Um, for ecology and evolutionary biology and some adjacent fields, it is standard to talk to who you want to work with beforehand. My biggest advice is like you want to, you want to know that that mentor wants you before you apply like that's the most ideal situation like if this person that you talk to is like encouraging you to apply like is like please I'll help you with your application 
that's a sweet deal. Like then you know that they want you. They can probably pull some strings or help out in that application process. And that's the biggest thing. And that like, so I guess my biggest advice would be to well in advance. Like I would say like the spring or the summer before the application cycle, start sending some cold emails, find people you want to work with, and then try to set up a Zoom meeting or a call. And then that lets you do exactly what Ajisha was just saying about like, get a vibe from this person, like figure out if you like them, figure out if you don't like them well in advance. And then if you don't like them, find someone else. And then try to keep communication going uh, up until the application cycle so that like you are someone that they're thinking about, your name is in their head, and then they'll like vouch for you a little bit more, or at least that's that's the feel that I'm getting thus far. Yeah, that. I really love that, uh, what you mentioned about like having them help with your applications and if they do, you're really good there. That's really true. Even for programs that you can just apply as is, even if those are your programs, still reach out to mentors because you generally get a feel of how their department will look like when you apply. So. Even if you're not going to work with them, still talk to them, see if you're interested in their work. But if not, at least they'll kind of go and like tell them, oh, this person's really interested in our program. I talked to them. They talked to my students. Hey, make sure we keep a lookout. The name will be in their head. And that's so important, especially between so many applications that they're going to be getting. Sweet. Uh, we're getting a couple of questions in chat. So the first one, this might be for Ashley Moore. So she's asking, how have you all incorporated interests outside of research, you know, science, communica science communication, environmental justice into your grad school experience? And did these interests alter which programs you applied for? Um, so maybe like the first half could be for Ashley, like how do you find yourself incorporating your interests into your uh, research? And then perhaps Jeremy and so like kind of answer the second half, like how your interests alter which programs you applied for. One second, I'm just rereading it so I make sure I don't miss it. Okay, I think I see. So um, part of why I'm interested in doing behavioral ecology is to um, help provide useful information for things like um, species conservation plans and things like that. And so um, a really big thing that I'm interested in is kind of the disconnect that exists between the scientific community and the public. And so especially while I was um, having my gap year working at the aquarium, I got time to do a lot of public education um, type things. And so that's something that I'm also really interested in. And so I try to do it. Um, it's not necessarily incorporated in my studies for grad school, but um, I'm part of a couple of different programs where I speak to, um, I would be speaking to local schools if it weren't a pandemic right now, but I go virtually on Zoom and I speak to um, K through 12 classes about my research. And so a lot of times I end up talking to school groups that live near systems that I work in. And so um, for me, I'm trying to incorporate as much public education as I can right now. It's a bit hard without being able to actually physically go anywhere. So right now it's been pretty interesting just figuring out how to go about that virtually. Um, but that's the main thing I've been doing um, so far in my first year. Sweet July, um, do you guys have anything about like how your interests altered where you applied for and where you chose to apply at the end? Yeah, I can definitely jump in on that. Um, so I'm really interested in academia and of course pursuing ecology, but one of my biggest goals is um, making science more accessible to the general public and more specifically to Latin American students and first-gen students, because as a first-gen Latin American student, I dealt with a number of obstacles that um, definitely I felt kind of made my experiences or my experience applying to grad school a little bit more untraditional, I would say. So I kept an eye out for programs that were kind of tailored towards that and for mentors who kind of mentioned that or professors who kind of mentioned that on their page. 
I remember when I was looking at different universities, I like stumbled across like University of California, Berkeley. And there were a lot of professors who like put statements out on that, on their lab web pages about their commitment to diversity, their commitment to um, ensuring science was accessible and community outreach. And that definitely affected what programs and what professors caught my eye because as much as studying ecology is really important to me, ensuring that my other goals are also met is just as important too. So definitely look at the web pages of the different professors you're looking into. See their, um, sometimes you can check out like their presence on social media and kind of see what media they're engaging with. Um, I definitely know a big one was with the onset of like the Black Lives Matter movement. I was really also looking for professors and scientists who were like engaging with that movement and supporting it. And again, that applied, that affected where I applied to and which professors I felt would catch my eye. All right, um, I'm gonna jump in real quick because I see another question in the chat and I also have to go because yeah. um, I know you need to host another session. All right, so for that question, um, so selecting a research topic for your last year, honestly, it's not so much about finding your future prospect, more so as to what your current interest is. So really, that is what I would say. And again, if you wanna have advice on like particular topics you might be interested in researching and talk to professors. Those, those are going to be your first point of contact, especially as an undergrad, if you are trying to figure out, okay, you're interested in, actually, you're interested in microbiology. So, you know, if you want to find a research question that you want to research and that's available at your institution, talk to professors. And even if it's, if it's not something that's available at your institution, they might be able to direct you to like an institute or something that's kind of around the same locale that you can apply or volunteer or work at. So that would be my advice for that. Sorry, I gotta go and I'm pretty sure I have an uh, interview, mock interview with you on Thursday. So e either way, we will continue the conversation there. So Cesar, I made you host. So you can wrap things up. You can take a little bit of time and answer more questions if you'd like. I would have to jump off right now. So see you guys later. Thank you. Um, My undergrad, I did an internship at the Georgia Aquarium and that was really interesting. I was mostly just doing um training with sharks and rays and so it it ties in pretty well to what my research interests are since i'm interested in behavior um and so yeah when i decided to take a gap year i wasn't really sure at first what i wanted to do i applied for a couple different jobs um at aquariums and also some local fwc jobs and ultimately that just seemed like the best fit for me i went um, I like took a trip and went and like toured the aquarium and met the people I'd be working with. And so for me, it wasn't just knowing it wasn't going to be a super permanent thing. I thought it would be interesting to, um, have an opportunity to do more interacting with the public. Whereas with like an FWC job, I would mostly be doing research again. And so for me, I just thought it would kind of expand my my skill set. Um, and then for time, I honestly wasn't really sure how long I wanted to take off. I ended up quitting my job a little bit before grad school started, mostly because of the pandemic. And so I think that affects things in a lot of ways too. And so that was kind of a big part of it. So I was glad to be able to go back and start school. It's definitely weird starting grad school during COVID, but um, it's also kind of nice to just not be trying to figure out my next move in the middle of a pandemic. So things that are going on in the world play a big part too. Yeah. Zula, I know you're, you're teaching and so that's a little bit outside of research. What made you like land on that? Um, and then you guys kind of talk more about that. Yeah. So um, I graduated now in the fall and as soon as I hit my finals week, um, burnout hit and I was like, you know what, that's okay. Um, I think we all mentioned a lot earlier that we really have to take care of ourselves and our mental throughout all this. So I decided to apply and thankfully I got the job as a teacher's assistant um, for a couple of reasons. A, because um, I spent the last semester working, I think it was two jobs, um, 
an internship and also going to school full time. So I was just kind of exhausted and I just wanted to focus on one thing and B because um, a lot of us, when we get to graduate school are either gonna be working as an RA or as a TA. So I decided I would kind of get some practice under my belt um, working as a teacher's assistant. So I just applied to that and I wanted to focus on that one thing so that I would have time set aside to just focus on you know, kind of building my strength up before graduate school again. And additionally, just taking this time to explore other interests and just focus on being a TA. Sweet. <laughs> Jeremy, did you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, so I, um, the decision of my gap year came about when I was doing my Ecological Society of America's fellowship in Texas. Um, I didn't think about taking a gap year. I was like going straight for the goalpost really. Um, and then in Texas, I had like no internet connection because I was on a field station in the middle of nowhere and I started panicking and I was like, I haven't reached out to anyone. It's just not happening. So I decided like, okay, gap year is totally fine. It'll give me a extra time to think about my graduate applications. Um, hopefully get like a publication out, like beef up my app. Um, and so then I was like, perfect. Well, I'll just apply to field positions um, or field gigs for my gap year and it'll be golden. And then we uh, ended up in a pandemic and that really was a bummer for applying to field positions. Um, a lot of the positions that I wanted to apply for, you know, got dropped because of the pandemic. A lot of them weren't able to offer a housing because of the pandemic. So it became cost prohibitive. Luckily I had the ability to take a research gig at my home institution. And even though like pay is like on and off and not ideal, um, I would say that in a gap year, you know, if you're able to do something that's related to what you wanna do that's getting paid, that's awesome. But even if you have something to like put on your CV that you kept doing something throughout the gap year, that would be ideal. You know, even if it's just like a few hours a week, you can still put, I was a research assistant throughout that gap year as well. Even if you're doing other stuff that's not really as related. And I think that that would be beneficial. Sweet. Yeah, thank you for that. And we're actually going a little bit over our time. So I think we should probably wrap up the panel because I know some people have some places to be. So thank you guys so much for coming to the Benefits Research Panel. Thank you to our awesome panelists again. Um, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Uh, we can find some of our information for tomorrow's sessions on our Twitter, um, which is just ESA Student Services. Um, so thank you so much for everything and we hope to see you guys soon. <laughs>